Keith, appreciate you and uh, Respiratory Associates for having me on. Appreciate everybody stopping by to uh, chit chat around. We're going to be talking about COPD kind of as a whole, uh, but specifically, we'll start to dive into the uh, elusive alpha 1 antitrypsin uh, deficiency. Couple objectives. Uh, we'll brief, briefly review uh, our regular COPDs, our chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Look at the etiology and the epidemiology of alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. We'll look at uh, current treatments and uh, possible future outlooks for the uh, curative or, or therapeutic um, management of alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. And there is a bit of information. Uh, so we'll be moving just a little bit, a little bit fast, um, and we can answer questions at the end of this, of course. So we're looking at chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I was taught you look at it uh, from the acronym CBABE, which uh, stands for cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, asthma, bronchitis, or chronic bronchitis, and emphysema. <laughs> we know uh, as therapists, that chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is common. Uh, it's sometimes preventable and it's very highly treatable. It is the third leading cause of death in the United States. It can be genetic, as we'll see later, uh, but it's largely environmental. It's linked with other comorbidities. We know that our uh, COPD patients come in, a lot of them have either some sort of renal, cardiac uh, insufficiency or, or diabetic uh, uh, situations on board with with their COPD. But the big thing is too, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease as a whole, especially uh, as we'll see later, a uh, sensory lobar emphysema uh, is a massive health burden uh, and it places a huge debt to the um, United States healthcare uh, expenditure. But most importantly, it diminishes uh, our quality of life or the patient's quality of life. We also know that with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, we have anatomical and physiological changes that come with it. Cystic fibrosis, uh, we'll begin with it. We'll go through the, the C-babe in order. Uh, one of the most common genetic conditions is characterized by thousands of cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator gene variations or CFTR uh, variations. So the most common uh, variation, I, I don't expect you to really remember this, the most common 70-75% uh, variation is a phenylalanine codon uh, 507. It's on chromosome 7 band Q31. So essentially what that kind of boils down to is it's an ab abnormal movement of sodium and chloride across the epithelial surface. And this is not just the lungs either. But for, for time's sake, we're going to be looking mostly at the lungs. But this, this essentially this, uh, equates to abnormally thick mucus everywhere in the body. So a little bit of good news, however. Greater than 70% of patients are diagnosed before the age of two years old. Generally, this is done gold standard wise uh, by the sweat chloride test, though it's not the only one uh, with the sweat, uh, sweat chloride test. Uh, usually perform it twice, uh, greater than 60 mL equivalents per liter is a definitive diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. Who does it impact really? Uh, whites, Hispanics, African Americans, Asians, respectively, uh, and it leads to recurrent pneumonias. Uh, scar tissue coupled with a plethora of other complications. Again, it impacts pretty much uh, uh, mu mucus all over the body. But how do we treat it? Um, oxygen therapy, if needed, of course, bronchopulmonary hygiene, uh, lung expansion, NEBs of all sorts, um, xanthines in some situations, uh, expectorants, and we want to make sure to do prophylactic antibiotics uh, in some, some situations, many situations anyway. Uh, and future kind of, I won't say future, this is a now thing, but uh, gene modulators such as Ivacaftor uh, have shown uh, success. Uh, gene therapy, lung transplant, uh, if applicable, uh, mechanical villanation in, in some situations, but uh, big therapies for these patients' rehab and strict nutrition regimens. 
And of course, there, there are other things that kind of go with it as well. I thought these were two, two nice little graphics here. And this kind of shows exactly how that CFTR um, modulator is working. So we look on the, le the, the left uh, uh, picture here, the left, left figure, we see that the, the normal CFTR gene is, or CFTR protein is working effectively, right? Chloride channels are going in, more than likely chloride channels are coming out, but then we look at our mutated CFTR channel and no, nothing's going through. We can also see that there's uh, tons of mucus above uh, that protein as well. And the right figure just kind of, it's a little more uh, descriptive. We can see that on the left side, the normal CFTR function, that that um, water, I want you to look at the arrows on each of those. The water itself is much bigger arrow because the chloride ions are able to go uh, through the uh, membranes, is to go through the protein. So in that same way, water follows as well. In a CFTR uh, dysregulated function, uh, less water goes through. So what does this really uh, equilibrate to? So we're looking at our saw layer is decreased, our saw layer decreases, our cilia are less effective. Uh, the, the less effective our cilia are, the more we're able to beat that um, mucus up and out of the airway. Again, retain secretions uh, and, and ammonia to couple with it. I'm glad I put this one next. So uh, with bronchiectasis, um, oh, I'm sorry. There we go. Uh, with bronchiectasis, um, there's permanent, it's characterized by permanent uh, distortion and dilation of one or more of the bronchi bronchial wall destruction this is more common in the lower less supportive airways if we can remember back uh, the smaller our airways get the less cartilaginous structure they have um, so in this way it's going to result in hyperinflation in some instances atelectasis a lot of instances fibrosis and certainly poor mucus clearance and this bronchiectasis can be acquired or congenital and takes three, has three different flavors, cylindrical, uh, cystic, and fusiform or varicose. And if you look down at the bottom right um, graphic here, we see that the varicose, it almost looks like varicose veins, right? So acquired, we're looking at recurrent pneumonias, um, recurrent bronchial obstruction, inhalation of toxic or chemical gases, and a recurrent aspiration. With the congenital set, we're looking at cystic fibrosis. So if bronchiectasis is, uh, you know, characterized or it can um, manifest due to recurrent pneumonias, uh, set aspiration or bronchial obstruction, cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis are, they kind of couple together. But also in that realm, and I usually butcher this, this name, it's Cartagener's syndrome, which is a uh, dextrocardia or kind of like a like a flipped heart, bronchiectasis and sinusitis. Uh, it's treated similarly to cystic fibrosis due to the recurrent pneumonias and the bronchial obstruction and so forth. So um, um, pulmonary hygiene and bronchodilation are very big topics for that. One characteristic uh, sign for or bronchiectic or bronchi yeah bronchiectic uh, sputum is that it settles into layers so you have a uh, patient you know cough into a cup whatever you want to sputum sample you go in you look and it's kind of settled into layers and it's very foul smelling with uh, any underlying uh, additions with bronchiectasis or something that are secondary to bronchiectasis then uh, you can almost almost tell that's probably what it is um, asthma. So the thing about asthma is it would take, I mean, there are books on asthma, there are whole lectures and there's whole certification programs for it. So this is super, super duper condensed. Uh, and we'll, and it's just a really quick run through of asthma. So uh, numerous agencies are involved with asthma prevention and maintenance and, and, and the like. Uh, there are two uh, major types. There's intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic is is somewhat unclear of exactly how the mechanism works, such as uh, exercise induced asthma or uh, cold air or lack of humidity, so on that may cause bronchospasm. 
with a- extrinsic asthma uh, or what, what would be known as allergic asthma uh, is some sort of external agent, uh, pet, pet dander, pollen, so on and so forth. So the general immunological response, our environmental allergen comes in, ends up busting open the mast cell. Uh, so the mast cell secretes uh, histamine, heparin, or eosinophilic uh, chemotactor factor of anaphylaxis, plate lactic factor, all of these different IgEs and immunoglobins uh, that eventually result in bronchospasm and goblet cell hyperplasia, which also manifests as decreased uh, airway with lots of mucus or, again, more, even more so decreased uh, airway lumen diameter. So I want you to look at that sputum eosinophilia, uh, and we know that with the eosinophilic uh, chemotactor that uh, these asthmatic patients, if you were to take a Y-cell count on them in a certain situation, that their eosinophils would be greatly increased. Other risk factors for, for asthma and, or, or at exacerbations, I guess you could say, uh, obesity, and that is generally with pretty much any disease, obesity is going to be a risk factor. Uh, gender. Uh, recurrent infections or or new infections, uh, sleep schedules. Again, I wish we could get into this, uh, but we just don't don't have the time uh, just yet. Maybe another lecture. Uh, but GERD, GERD is one of the big ones. And a lot of the times, um, if I'm seeing patients um, in a clinical setting, I'll ask them, you know, is your do you have acid reflux? If so, has it been managed? Is it being managed here? So if our stomach is holding in their hydrochloric acid and it starts to rise up through our esophagus, you're going to inhale microparticulates of the hydrochloric acid. And your, your lungs, especially if they're hyperreactive, are just generally not going to like that at all. Uh, spirometry. So if you're going to do a PFT on these individuals, Say if you want to differentiate between emphysema and, and asthma, you look at spirometry showing a, a pre and post reversibility FEV1 greater than 12% or, or greater than or equal to 12% or roughly 150 to 200 um, mLs. There's four, four classifications, uh, intermittent, mild, moderate, severe. And if I'm not mistaken, I think like the asthma educator course or, or certificate goes very in-depth with these classifications and how to manage them. Uh, general the general management of of asthmatic patients not not your critical care setting or anything like that but your general management you want to develop a patient provider relationship in that uh, the the patient is comfortable speaking with the provider and asking questions and, and obtaining information while the provider is also very well aware of the patient situation be it socioeconomically or health wise so on and so forth. Uh, so with this relationship, uh, or or on your own, uh, you want to identify and eliminate those triggers. Those triggers being, is it your dog? Is it your cat? Is it is it a seasonal type of situation? And if so, then you know that it's probably a pollen type thing or a cold type thing. And you can you can start to assess, treat, monitor, and manage any type of situation after the fact once you identify and you eliminate those triggers. And of course, we would take uh, medications to simmer the situation down, um, such as, uh, say, chromium sodium or Montelukast, something like that, some mast cell stabilizers. Of course, we rescue meds and all of that. Uh, the, the patient may need oxygen, um, bronchopulmonary hydrine, of course, NEBS, right? We know this, and sometimes mechanical ventilation. If we look into some of the literature, we also see that uh, instead of like going straight to, to ECMO in a non-response or status asthmatic situation, we they may be able to try inhaled anesthetics uh, such as isoflurane and, and, and all of those. And they have shown to break asthmatic situations quickly. Uh, but that being said, there's numerous uh, nebulizers, injections, gases, so on and so forth that can um, aid in the reversibility of as asthma. And one thing I, I really want to know is budesonide hasn't been shown to work very well with, with neutrophilic situations. And when we get a little bit further, I want you to keep that neutrophilic mindset. Budesonide and other inhaled corticosteroids work very well with eosinophilic situations. Okay. So this being said, it's, it's, it's a high standard for asthmatic patients to take uh, inhaled corticosteroids to simmer down that 
as we see that sputum eosinophilia at the bottom left graph there, uh, or a um, picture. So when we when we think about that, think about that with asthmatics versus um, emphysematic patients as we move forward. Chronic bronchitis, uh, chronic uh, characterized as chronic and productive cough for three months in each of two consecutive years. Interpret that how you will. Uh, chronic inflammation in the peripheral airways, bronchospasm, and in, in the after uh, uh, an amount of time, of course, in the late stage, there may be air trapping as well. Uh, excessive mucus and possible plugging. Of course, as we see with this chronic inflammation uh, and the increase in sputum uh, production, as we would see with an inflammatory situation, um, there may be excessive mucus and possible plugging. This is usually in unison with emphysema uh, with millions of diagnoses. So generally, when, when a lot of folks talk about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, they don't really think about um, CBAME, right? It's just really all right, emphysema and chronic bronchitis or one or the other. But there are some differences. So these individuals, I want you to look at the bottom right picture here. So the fella on the right, um, that's your blue bloater. That's your chronic bronchitis patient. Um, I, he, he looks like my papa, I'll be honest with you, um, with his hair all slicked or whatever. But our fella on the right here, that is uh, what we, majority of us see for just chronic shortness of breath. This is our pink uh, puffer, which we'll get into in a little bit later. Uh, so these, the fell on the right, they may be a little bit more stocky or overweight. They have this hypoventilatory syndrome uh, where they don't breathe as much or as deep. And in this situation, we have a higher cardiac demand. So their lungs per se, the, the oxygenative situation of the lungs, the ventilatory situation of the lungs, um, should be okay for quite a while. But as it slowly starts to build, there is higher, higher demand. Uh, on the heart, and these individuals may manifest with uh, a right heart failure or poor pulmonary in very late stages of uh, um, chronic bronchitis. And then in the same way as your late stage emphysematic patients, there'll be situations of polycythemia. So with this hypoventilatory syndrome, generally with some, some probably some type of OSA and right heart failure with polycythemia, we're looking at a pl plenty of clots and decreased cardiac outputs. Um, as we could imagine. All right. <clears throat> so emphysema, specifically sensory lobar emphysema, and there are uh, a number of variations of emphysema, but today we're going to be looking at sensory lobar and pan lobar. So sensory lobar is characterized as dilation and destruction of the airways distal to the terminal bronchi. So after the terminal bronchi, we have the respiratory bronchi, alveolar sacs, and uh, alveolar ducts and alveolar sacs, right? So this is distal to our conductive airway. So uh, sensory lobar emphysema is mostly caused by tobacco smoke. And we can quantify really any type of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease uh, using our pulmonary function testing. Uh, many, many, many people use the gold guidelines. Uh, I myself use the gold guidelines. And you can look through there. Uh, but emphysema characterized by a decrease in a, a DLCO or a lung diffusion of carbon monoxide will manifest in values less than 25 milliliters per minute per millimeters of mercury. So this, this individual here is our pink puffer. Okay. Uh, typical cachectic COPD patient. You walk into the room, they're tripoding, they're using accessory muscles, purslip breathing. It just looks like they're huffing and puffing all the time. And generally, these people, after they get so far, they will be actually malnourished. I mean, think of the increased muscle strain, first off, and the caloric intake that it, it uh, takes to maintain breathing 30 times a minute, right? Uh, but these individuals, uh, we, I'll go in and ask my patients, I'll say, you know, do you have a command station that you stay at at home? You've got a rocking chair with two tables on each side. One, one table's got your tissues and your, your liter of Mountain Dew, and the other side's got your meds, or that's where you eat, books, whatever. And a lot of them say, yeah. So generally what happens is you get short of breath. You don't want to move as much. Uh, you get short of breath. You can't eat as much. So in this same way, you're not, you're not moving around and you're not eating. So you're literally wasting away. So you get short of breath, you get anxious. Well, I'm not doing that. 
you start to eat, you get anxious. Well, I don't want to do that too much either. You go to the doctor, you get short of breath. Well, I don't want to do that. And it's just this vicious cycle of, of anxiety, shortness of breath, uh, in it and inactivity and decreased nutritional intake. I thought this was a good graphic to kind of show the difference between like your 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 normal um um a cena or cena and your century low bar pan low bar emphysema. So we look at century low bar on the bottom left, uh, labeled B. It looks like it's pretty much right in the center of the branch, right? So century low bar, whereas with pan low bar, it's at the very very end, and that should make that should make some sense as it, as as we look forward uh, at the genetic components of pan low bar emphysema. And what do you know? So again, proximal to, to the terminal bronchi is um, known as the most severe form of emphysema. The progression of uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease outside of this, whether you smoke or occupational pool, because uh, you can stop those things, and your chronic obstructive pulmonary disease should should slow rapidly. Uh, in this situation, that's irrelevant. Um, it's commonly associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is genetic, and estimates of one to every 50 emphysema cases, but we'll see that that's likely an inaccurate assumption. So what is it? How does it how does it cause it causes emphysema? How does it do that? Well, it was initially described in 1963. And to dive into just a little bit of the, the hard science portion of it, alpha one antitrypsin is a protein produced in the liver mainly in small portions in other places of the body. So alpha one antitrypsin uh, causes liver um uh, can can impact the liver heavily as well. But alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, maintains the protease and antiprotease homeostasis or the breakdown and buildup, so on and so forth, or the catalyzation of uh, proteins in the body. So alpha-1 antitrypsin is a protein, right? Let's keep that in mind. So the protease neutrophil elastase, right? So protease is breaking, breaking proteins down. The protease neutrophil elastase specifically when in large amounts destroys the lung and alveolar structure and matrix. And I say matrix because uh, neutrophil elastase can degrade elastin, collagen, etc. So if we note with emphysematic patients, we note air trapping, we note generally in, in many cases increased compliance, which is a degradation of the elastic bands that are covering our or are involved with our alveolus, right? So neutrophil elastase eats that elastic elasticity away, right? Breaks it almost in the same exact manner. So smoking has also shown to decrease the amount of alpha-1 antitrypsin protein in circulation as well. So you can imagine if an individual had this genetic situation, where um, they had alpha-1 antitrypsin and was also smoking, how rapidly, once the alpha-1 antitrypsin really took, or the deficiency took hold, how rapidly their lung function would decline. Uh, so, so kind of bullet down. So a deficiency of, of alpha-1 antitrypsin creates a situation in which there are too many elastin-destroying proteases and not enough inhibitors. If emphysema, even century low bar, has a tendency to have that increased compliance, and, and we'll definitely see that with the um, alpha-1 deficiency. So this manifests in the Serpina-1 gene, Q30, uh, Q32.1, well, 0.12, uh, not to dive too, too far into that. Epidemiology and testing. Uh, most common in, in whites, in, in respectively, whites, uh, Hispanic, Blacks, Mexican-Americans, and Asians with generally no risk. Uh, 100,000 Americans underrepresented due to testing. So there, the estimates state that 3 to 5 million cases worldwide. And that's why I noted earlier about the 1 to 50 cases. Uh, the ranges uh, for peoples with this, this gene malformation 
there are there are so many numbers so the folks that did the human genome um, I use their statistic here in the uh, the 2500 so generally take one to 2500 uh, in individuals with emphysema or so on and so forth in the case of three to five million worldwide may have alpha one or some sort of uh, secondary portion if they smoke so again estimates state 90 percent of folks are underdiagnosed the severity is dependent on the phenotype which again that we'd be diving a little deep there uh, mm and zz phenotypes smoking certainly increases the risk as we noted um, earlier and it's roughly equal in men and women as as statistics stand now uh, a blood sample is drawn for testing and there there is uh, specific manners in which they do test these the uh, test the blood nephelometers are generally one of the the most common so a diagnosis is confirmed by identifying serum alpha one antitrypsin levels uh, and again values are are all over the board here of less than 80 milligrams per deciliter or less than 50 milligrams per deciliter with uh, nephelometry. So um, it's recommended that that genotyping be coupled with this blood sample. I want you to to note that um, when when they when somebody takes a blood sample, the sample generally isn't just as good as those who took the sample. So you take the sample, maybe you did it inaccurately. Maybe you took the sample and you labeled it inaccurately. Or maybe you got it in got it to lab correctly, lab mishandled it, so on, so on, so on. So for something this serious, genotyping is recommended along with um, blood sample draws. Uh, we'll, we'll note these numbers here. The ranges do vary. Uh, some, some statistics say 75 to 150, some say 100 to 300. And I feel I felt like the um, less than 50 and less than 80 were pretty pretty adequate numbers to base it off of and uh now and a nephilometer used to measure light scattering um not the attenuation of light caused by turbidity in the blood just to note that so our pathologic changes i mean we should be aware of this right our, our symptoms are showing uh, cough shortness of breath of uh, chest discomfort in many many cases fatigue and in, in uh, stage two and above, and a produ extra produce, uh, production of um, a mucus. So alpha-1 antitrypsin generally manifests in the more gravity-impacted lobes. If there's going to be a deficit, the bottom lobes, which gravity is going to pull the blood there, is going to notice it the, the most. Um, these patients, they manifest as uh, pink puffers. And, and these patients... I hope some of you all can relate, but it, you know, they're the Q2 PRNs um, or the Q1 PRNs or the people you put, you know, you, you give a little, little extra nib to uh, and nothing that you, that you do can alleviate their shortness of breath, right? Um, too bad we don't aerosolize morphine or, or Lasix um, to, to decrease those J receptor function. But uh, there's nothing you can do. They'll, they'll just be short of breath always. Whoops. There we go. Um, airway remodeling, of course, as they smoke, there are small amounts of damage over and over and over and over and over for a long amount of time. And this wound healing uh, manifests as airway remodeling. Uh, mucus plugging, of course, and, and especially with our end-stage COPD patients because they uh, once they get to a certain stage, it becomes a restrictive situation. So they can't take a big deep breath in. They can't get enough gumption up and behind that mucus to move anything around. Uh, and then we'll see, you know, pneumonias, plugging, so on and so forth. Hyperinflation uh, of the lungs due to air trapping. Polycythemia in many, many, many cases. Um, and that decrease in in or, or a chronic hypoxic situation we'll see polycythemia they manage for a little while with the 2-3 bpg but that's like a very short-term fix and polycythemia soon follows um to some chemoreceptor failure of the central chemoreceptor and 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 maluse of peripheral chemoreceptors air trapping of course and diaphragmatic insufficiency as our lungs start or you know tend to grow longer and longer and longer 
uh, that's less room for our diaphragm to contract and and bring the air in. I, I just want to throw this PFT in here showing showing the obstruction. Uh, we'll look uh, at the blue line here that's scooping out. That's pretty much tall tail of of an obstructive situation. Let's see if I can have a pen here. Uh, yeah, there we go. So this this about right here. That's what we're looking at. That's that's going to tell your obstruction, but you can also measure like uh, with with your bronchiectasis. You can measure your uh, it's in the larger airways, uh, it, respectively. It's in the larger airways, so you can see that manifest in situations such as uh, FEF two hundred to twelve hundred, those large airway values, or the uh, FEF twenty five seventy five for those smaller airways, and those will manifest in different areas of your PFT to notice your scooping, and of course with other. Uh, subjective information objective information to, to make a definitive diagnosis for these chronic obstructive patients um, accurately manage them accordingly so with alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, current treatment management so one of the most popular treatments or i guess probably the only one that's really shown promise uh, for alpha-1 deficiency is augmentation or replacement therapy and this is essentially healthy, healthy blood. Uh, alpha one antitrypsin, full blood, is administered to the patient to help to circulate to decrease. You know, and eventually they're going to start to have that decrease again. They'll get more blood, so on and so forth. Uh, again, this is more I won't say preventative in a way, um, but it's it's definitely not curative uh, unless you can just have like a constant. I don't know, influx of alpha-1 through a blood, through a pump, something. Uh, so it's really just trying to slow the progression of the disease. Because again, as the as the blood starts to withdraw from the alpha antitrypsin, then slowly more and more and more damage is going to be done to the lungs. And you get new blood, then it starts to simmer down, more damage, new blood. Again, another cycle. There are... Uh, uh, some of the some of the therapies that are out now again would take you know pretty much a whole lecture in itself uh, small molecular correctors certain inhaled medications and recombinant protein therapy so with these patients um the main the treatment of the management is is similar uh, besides the augmentation uh that way in very very close patient provider relationship is general COPD maintenance bronchodilators be it direct or indirect and we know that say an individual has a as a uh you know an fuv of 50 percent per se they get sick it drops to 30 we can only bring them back to 50 percent we can only bring them back to their baseline indirect and indirect being your uh, uh muscarinic and your uh, beta drugs steroids so remember what i was talking about with the eosinophilic versus the neutrophilic properties uh, of, of airway obstruction right so with copd there is a neutrophilic problem right neutrophilic elastase so there's a neutrophilic problem and the steroids and none to my knowledge are neutrophilic specific uh, but our inhaled steroids are very effective against eosinophilic so those steroids again there's still neutrophilic properties to a CO, to an emphysematic patient but they do not work oops do not work as well on emphysema as they would asthma which is something that i think medicine should be looking into but and just make note of that and it increases your chances of pneumonia too uh, but airway clearance and oxygen of course uh, pulmonary rehab nutritional support palliative care consults and copd action plans uh, part a portion of my my current employment is pulmonary uh, navigator. This is this is this is a big portion of what I do, and the patients are are very receptive to it. Not many people are referred for pulmonary rehab. Uh, I know many of us that are working in in hospitals. You go up into the patient's room and it will say cardiac diet or diabetic diet. Myself personally, I've never seen a pulmonary diet on anybody's board in their room. Right. So very, very important uh, palliative care consults because, it, you know, for instance, for the instance of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, 
they're going to need these things in place. They're going to, unless there's some, some type of cure coming out, they're going to need these things in place. Uh, and COPD action plans, which address a number of socioeconomic situations, uh, whether or not they can get to their appointments and afford their medication, so on and so forth. Smoking cessation, do them a favor. If they're smoking, good God, please just try to get them to stop because it's, it's doubling the factor of decline, lung decline. Uh, home care, of course, as as the disease progresses, hopefully slowly, right? Uh, they may need home care to get around to do things around the home or get medications or see physicians in the home. Or, or again, they may need this uh, non-invasive ventilation uh, as they start to decline. And some candidates uh, for may may they may be candidates of, of bronchial stents and lung volume reduction. In very few cases, lung transplant. So what does the future really look like? Well, it's genetic, right? And maybe some of us are familiar with gene therapy and gene modulation with uh, cystic fibrosis patients. So essentially, scientists have come up with a way to modify these viruses because when a virus enters into the cell, it hijacks the cell's machinery, tells the cell, hey, create my stuff instead, right? So they're able to, but our cells are very sensitive to these viruses and so on and so forth. So they'll take these bacterial phage, uh, which can be inhabited by a um, genetically modified virus. And they're able to enter it into the cell, as we see this bottom left figure here, goes into the cell, uh, generally phagocytosis or, or through the endosome. The endosome is disrupted. The, the capsule is broken out. The bacterial phage is then, in some cases, eradicated by the body itself. Uh, but then it releases the genetic information, for instance, uh, to be read and, and, and released from the uh, nucleus. In this way, if they're able to get a, a, a protein here and say, all right, we want you to do this very specific thing. You've got these extra little genes on you. Oops, I'm sorry. You got these extra little genes on you. I need you to implant them here, right? For instance, we got our new donor DNA or RNA, what have you. And for, for instance, for uh, the CFTR gene, you can replace a, a malformed or misfunctioning uh, CFTR gene. And theoretically, I guess you 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 have corrected the situation as a whole. So, uh, and, and and again, right? So the the protein or the intended effect goes through the blood and enacts its purpose, right? But alpha one antitrypsin occurs in the serpina one gene, right? Was it p p twenty three point one or so, or thirty two point one two? Um. So if you're able to, to do this, to target a specific type of situation, say this is the CFTR right here, right? Why can't you do it with alpha-1 antitrypsin? A lot of this is accomplished via the CRISPR-Cas gene editing system, gene uh, modulation and gene therapy being introduced into the body in small amounts to enact a smaller effect and or decrease the slowing. But we're looking at future, future uh, uh, it'd be curative, right? To, to eliminate the gene completely so that, so we snip it out, stoop, right here, cut it right on out, and we won't get into the uh, genetics of it. Uh, and then we just piece it back together, right? Correct it all together. Very, very exciting uh, science, very, very complex science but very promising as well. So what, what does this all kind of mean to, to, to our RTs, right? Well, I mean, come on. Uh, respiratory therapists, cardiopulmonary specialists. Um, my, my associate's degree was in cardiopulmonary science, right? Heart and lungs. Uh, we, are the, we have a plethora of knowledge surrounding obstructive disease, restricted disease, cardiac uh, insufficiencies, how those two work together. Uh, how those things work together with, with other portions of the body, such as the lungs, such as the GI tract and the kidneys. So we're, we're the experts, right? 
uh, we're able to decipher uh, the needed care. We see these uh, emphysematic patients and, and, and cystic patients day in and day out. That's our bread and butter. Even if you don't know what you're doing when you graduate, you will become seasoned and be able to look at a patient and say, okay, this is probably what you're going to need. And a lot of the times the patient will benefit from it. Um, so you're able to, to decipher what that patient needs. If, if you walk by a patient's room and they're snoring really loud and their sats are a little bit low, you might say, you might pop in and say, hey, do you wear a CPAP or a BiPAP or anything like that at night? You know what they need and, and, and healthcare needs us for it. Uh, you're the experts regarding specifically chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and, and again, other cardiopulmonary complications, but as widespread and diffuse as uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is in its many flavors, emphysematic patients, uh, especially uh, around about in the South where, where, where many of us are, uh, but everywhere in different forms, uh, that's, that's, we see them every single day. And we are in the perfect position for patient advocacy because we're able to decipher needed care. We are the experts regarding COPD. And we're working directly with those patients. So how can you, you know, you, you staff therapists, you're doing acute care, long-term care, uh, sniffs, what have you. Uh, branch out as COPD navigators, pulmonary navigators, branch out into case management or community health. Uh, branch, branch out and, and be a part of the ethics committee or be on the ethics board, uh, especially as, as RTs. And we know uh, how little trained many of us are at end of life care, but how often we find ourselves right at the bedside during that situation. Uh, RTs and, and our perception and our experience with the death and dying and just complex situations places us in a good situation to be on an ethics committee. Uh, academics and educators, mentors. Uh, so, so myself, I got into to academics and education while also still being a clinician and branching out into one of these these niche fields. Uh, but to do this, we again, we are the experts, right? How many people come up to you and say, well, "Can you just tell me what you think about this patient?" Right? How many times does your nurse call when they they literally just don't know what to do? Uh, so in the realm of cardiopulmonary science, we are the academics. We can be educators, and many of us are mentors as well. Researchers, uh, those in, in, in the respiratory care, care field that are researchers, bless your heart. Because um, we're looking at research, we're looking at academics, we're looking at ethics. Uh, and many times we're looking at also mentors and educators as well. So bless your heart. Generally, RTs that are that are in the research field wear many, many hats. Public health uh, kind of goes hand in hand with community health as well, but on a larger scale. RTs know uh, asthmatic patients that are presenting unsymptomatically, but are living with symptoms. Maybe it's an environmental situation. Do you live in an apartment complex that's full of mold? Is there a, a, a bug infestation? So on and so forth. We know what those triggers are and what they look like. And also specialists. Uh, our neonatal pediatric specialists, our pulmonary function technologists, our sleep specialists, our adult critical care specialists, uh, and, and so on, uh, tobacco cessation specialists, and so on and so on. Um, the more we do, the more we learn, the more we can be, the more we are able to decipher the needed care, the more we become experts, and the more we can play in every field of a patient's care to most impact them, especially in the realm of alpha-1 antitrypsin and readmission rate and ineffective therapy. Let's just do a quick recap. So COPD is complex, right? Uh, many of us lose track of how complex it actually can be, and it is ever evolving. Emphysema is not the only obstructive condition. We got to make note of that, right? I've worked with physicians, and every time a patient comes in, they're like, well, they've got asthma. Mm, no. Also, to note with emphysema, 
uh, especially for quantification measures, you're going to want a, some type of pulmonary function test uh, to, to accurately stage and accurately treat and manage that patient. Uh, emphysema specifically can manifest genetically, as we just covered. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is hereditary and is underrepresented uh, diagnostically. There are certain and specific therapies for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, but generally as it stands right now, uh, it's maintained in a very, very, very similar fashion with, with a few uh, avenues such as uh, the uh, transfusions and the uh, genetic modulators and so forth. Science is leaning more towards curative mechanics than versus therapeutics. And I mean, this makes sense. Um, you know, the therapeutics are not going to work, right? They, they may manage symptoms periodically, uh, but the treatment for COPD we know is, 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 which is, that's what it is. It's management of a generally, because most, well, I won't say most, let's be fair. A lot of them do keep smoking. So it's progressive, um, and there's really not much besides, you know, cramming smoking cessation in their face and doing referrals that um, is going to cure it. So for, for this situation, for those that can't help it, science is leaning more towards curative mechanics. And again, folks, y'all are the experts, right? Y'all know the lung. Y'all know vents. Y'all know acute care, critical care, babies. Uh, old folks, I mean, geriatrics, I mean, hey, geriatrics, bariatrics, so on and so forth. Y'all are the experts, right? Heart and lung, that's you. You are the advocate, especially in situations like this. Uh, many, many different medical facilities, especially like uh, stroke facilities and things like that, they put uh, an emphasis on heart patients. But you are the advocate. If you see a situation uh, that would override some type of cardiac issue, speak up uh, and back back your claims up back yourself up with science and you can make the difference right so learning just anything from this in a situation in the future you may be able to say hey well they've been readmitted none of this stuff ever works uh, they're just getting worse and worse and worse and they don't smoke maybe you guys should do an alpha one uh, anti-trypsin blood test just because i heard that once in a, in a ceu lecture uh, so i hope you all uh, have gained something from this uh, myself researching material and going on, I, I certainly it all brought it back to me from from a patho class in, in respiratory. But uh, we'll close it up. I'll turn the mic off. If if you all have any questions, feel free to uh, to shoot them out.